men. If you don't have a Bible, please go in the back and grab one. Um, if you need one, keep it. If you don't have one, I'll take a second and wait for you if anybody has to get one so you can read along with it. I didn't put the verses up today because I'll be coming back to them later. So, start with Revelation 2, 2 through 5. This is John's letter to the church at Ephesus in Asia Minor. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring, enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Second reading is from Revelation 2, 19 to 23. John's letter to the church at Thyatira. I know your works your love and faith and service and patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her on to a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of their works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. I'd like to dismiss the children. Today we're going to take a little break from our teaching in the book of Acts. However, I'd really like to continue in the theme of the spirit-filled mission of the church, which we've been going through um, recently as we go verse by verse, book by book in the Bible. I've chosen two churches from the first century today to talk about, Ephesus and Thyatira. The historical account of the book of Acts establishes the foundation for these two churches in Asia Minor. Both Ephesus and Thyatira were churches of the first century born of the spirit-filled mission of the apostles. Both were shepherded by the living apostles sent by Christ. Both are cautionary examples of what stands to happen when the word of the Father is not applied in its entirety. The Apostle John pointed out the problems of these two churches in the form of a letter. The letter is the last book of the Bible and God's final word, the book of Revelation. John informs us that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day as an angel of the Lord instructed John to send this letter and message to the seven churches of Asia Minor he said it was the revelation of Jesus Christ. As he opened that letter in verse 3, before he got to the letter to the churches, he said this. And I thought it was kind of nice because the verse blesses me and blesses you. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and who keep what is written for in it, for the time is near. The early disciples understood that loving others and remaining true to God go together. I chose these two churches because of their contrast. One has solid doctrine, 
but has an issue with love. The other has love, but it disregards doctrine. Because of the two churches and the book of Acts proximity in time and the witness of the Holy Spirit, I chose three specific perspectives to look at this from. Plans and promises. How God had a plan of salvation from the beginning and how his promises point to it and assure us of it. Secondly, preparations and provisions. How God prepared and provided for his plan of salvation from the beginning. And thirdly, precautions and protections. How God protected and preserved his church. Let's start with plans and promises. Almost all plans require promises, if you think about it. When we plan to buy a home, we sign a promissory note. It's called the mortgage. This is a promise that will repay that what was loaned to us. And when we get married, we're making another promise. A promise before God and a promise to our spouse that we will make a lifetime commitment. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, sickness and in health. We know it. But you can see how these promises can get real complicated. While not every promise is as significant and life-altering, if we were to stop and tally all the promises we make in a single day, I think we'd be surprised. I actually tried to do this, and I actually gave up on it. When I started this morning, the first thing I did, I promised my wife I'd get a loaf of bread, and I came home and I got the wrong ones. I, I promised Lou I'd have the sermon on Monday. I didn't have it on, uh, on Monday quite on time. I was supposed to make the coffee, and then when I promised to make the coffee, the coffee wasn't here, so I had to get it. It became very complicated. That's the way it is in life for us. But a promise is really only as good as a person who makes it. If that person is short-sighted or impulsive, the plan tends to crumble beneath him or her, often shattering the promise as well. We've all experienced what poor planning can do to great ideas. Now, I have probably one of the best example of this dropped right into my lap. I didn't have to search for it. For it. You're all aware of affordable health care. Now, when I put down, give an example, I had a th uh, that was a while back, and I said, wow, this is unbelievable. But do you know that affordable health care, in its essence, is not a bad idea. It was a plan. I don't think most people would argue with that. The problem was the plan was not carried out very well, and as it falls apart, we all see it. And it came with promises. You can keep your health plan, period. I'm not making fun of anybody or picking on a political slant. I'm just trying to make the example, and that one was glaring. <laughs> Thankfully, we have a faithful God who has made and kept each of his promises. I want to take a look at some of the selected promises that make my points today that were made by God. One of the first promises we see that God makes in the garden, and we really get see this promise because we get to eavesdrop on a conversation between a serpent and Eve. Eve approaches the tree of knowledge and the serpent says to her, you know, you sure you can't eat of that tree? And She confirms to him, yes, we're told she can't eat of that tree lest we die. God made a promise. If you touch or eat of that tree, you will surely die. Death came into the world wasn't the way it was. God held his promise. But it's interesting that after that was done, God removed them, Adam and Eve, from the garden and put an angel at the entrance with a flaming sword so they couldn't get to the tree of life. Was he punishing them? Or was it one of the most miraculous acts of grace we ever had? Because if they had gotten to that tree of the life, they would have got there in a state of depravity and it would have literally been hell on earth for eternity for them. But God had a greater plan behind it all. We studied a verse 
in Genesis 3.15 when we went through that series several years ago. And the verse is a veiled prophecy, and it goes like this. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Let me state it first, a little bit about this first. Enmity is a state of being in an enmity, and it's between the offspring of him, who he's talking about as a serpent, and her offspring. We know that the offspring of a woman came, the woman was a virgin at the time, and that offspring was when God brought his son into the world. And then it states that he shall bruise your head, referring to her offspring having a fatal attack on Satan, yet Satan will strike him. Could this just possibly be the promise of a savior? As God showed his grace by not letting him get to the tree of life in a state of depravity, now he promises here that a savior will come to take care of the evil that's in the world. How deeply we trust in God's promises is a real reflection of our own faith. Faith isn't just hope. It's the anticipation of a promise and a certainty that it'll happen. The more deeply we seek and cultivate a relationship with the Father, trusting his word, the greater and stronger our faith is in his promise. Noah had a promise. Noah was promised that a flood was coming. Noah believed the promise. Noah built the boat, loaded it up with his close family. They survived. If Noah had doubted, they all would have been destroyed. Reminds me of a, a story of a, a little girl, a little first grade girl who was staring out the window when she sat in the aisle seat and watched the rain come down as the deluge formed on the ground. And she saw the puddles start to forming, and the little girl was a, a little girl of faith. And she tapped the little girl on the front of her in the shoulder, and she told her all about the story as she watched the water amass on the ground. And while she was talking with the little girl, the teacher came up and walked behind her and said to her, you know, that really didn't happen. It's not the truth. It's just the story. And this little girl couldn't be shaken from her point. She, she knew that it was true. And she looked up at the teacher and said, well, I tell you what then, when I go to heaven, I'm going to ask Noah. And the teacher, in a last effort, looked at the girl and said, well, what if Noah didn't go to heaven? And the little girl looked back at her and said, well, then you can ask him. kind of brings the point of a childlike faith that we're called to have, the Bible tells us to have. That's what God promises are to us, that type of faith. After this passage, another promise is made in Deuteronomy, later on by Moses says to the people, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is him, to him you shall listen. So now we saw a savior and a prophet. Prophet being one who delivers revelation of God, futuristic or current, or interpretation. And look at, notice at the end of that where it says, it is to him you shall listen. Moses is emphatic in that. In verse in Acts 3, 22, Peter says this, referring to that verse. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. It's a warning there about that prophet, as we've seen before, that that savior, how important his word is. And then again in verse 25, he says to the same people, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The picture starting to come together here. I, uh, I love to listen to the uh, 
the theologian R.C. Sproul. He's my favorite. And um, R.C. Sproul was at a wedding, and a girl came up to him and asked him if she would sign and put an encouraging verse in her Bible. So he didn't like to do that, he said, but he did it anyways. So he wrote in her Bible this verse here. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, the smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Well, <laughs> the girl got back from her honeymoon and searched Dr. Sproul out, and she couldn't understand what was going on, and she asked him about that verse. But the story behind that verse is very interesting, which alludes to the security of God's promises. In Genesis, Abraham was promised that he would be the father of many nations. Abraham asked for a sign of the promise. God put Abraham to sleep. And when Abraham was, to sl was asleep, he saw the vision of a flaming torch passing two, between two pieces of a sacrificed animal. In that culture, the way they would, what we call ratify a contract or make sure that it was a contract and that people were promising to make it in that day, they would sacrifice an animal, put the halves apart, and walk through it. And that would be a sign of, uh, of agreement that they, they would hold true to it. In this case, God was telling them that I am the fire pot that walks through it and there is no hire to swear upon except myself. This promise will come true and I swear to it. That was a word of encouragement that he was giving to the woman. I'm not sure he succeeded, but it's the truth of God. We see a savior and a prophet. Now in Isaiah 7.14, we're given this. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall be called his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. First we saw a savior. Now we see a prophet. Now we see God himself. Interesting how this plan starts to come together and play out. Actually in the form of what we know as the gospel. The gospel is truth. It's God's truth. Over and over again in the Old Testament, God tells us of the coming Savior and prophet. No more trustworthy, unquestionable promises have ever been made. His plans were clear and certain. Plans that he chose to move forward on that first Christmas day. And through the plan and the promise, we know we all have a savior, a prophet, and God himself. Take a look at preparations and provisions. God doesn't stop with a promise and a plan. He prepares us for and provides us with the means. Christ's ministry wouldn't begin for some 30 years or so after he was born. Being prepared and provided for by the Father, he would grow in stature and, yes, knowledge in his humanity. He would be baptized and anointed by the Holy Spirit. Do you see how God's plan of salvation is providential? How God provided for this all along? Take a look at the apostles. Jesus would select 12 men to follow him and learn from him. Throughout his ministry of three years, his time would be spent almost entirely with these men. He would work, live, eat, and be in full community with them. As a prophet, he would astound them with his command of scripture. He would teach them about the kingdom of God a term that Jesus used frequently. He would reveal deep truth by way of parables, which are stories analogous to a culture, a cultural understanding that would help them comprehend a much deeper spiritual truth. 
He would walk on water, commanding the sea and wind. He would heal the sick. He would give sight to the blind and on more than one occasion raise the dead. He would bring Peter, John, and, and James to the transfiguration who had full view of his glory. They would also see him die and see him again after he arose from the dead, just as he said he would. God the Father, through his Son, prepared these apostles for their apostolic commission. They lived with God the Son, gaining knowledge and wisdom from him. They also had something else, something very important. They had a deep love for Christ, and the Holy Spirit was given to them as a comforter. That's preparation and provision. Before Jesus ascends back to the Father, the apostles are instructed to wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon them. The boldness of the Spirit fell upon them, and the Spirit-empowered mission of the church had begun. Great numbers came to faith, and the gospel of Jesus Christ was being spoken and dispersed. Churches sprang up in the Middle East, in Asia Minor, and began to move all over the, over the world. And again, we're seeing God's plan moving forward through his preparation and through his provision. I want to go to precaution and protection. But challenges for the early church were very similar to those that we experience today. You know, false and pagan religions often crept in. In some cases, the church became full of religious zealots who loved sound doctrine but separated themselves from others. They were cold and uncaring to the very ones that Jesus loved. Yet other churches didn't care about truth. They were warm and caring, but they disregarded the truth they were to represent in love. We look at two churches from the first century Asia Minor that the Apostle John wrote to in Revelation 2, Ephesus and Thyatira. The warnings and encouragement he gave to them are still extremely applicable today. To Ephesus, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the work you did at first. If not, I will come to you and move, remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Ephesus was a city on the west coast of Asia Minor, which is current-day Turkey. To the west was the Aegean Sea. John was exiled on an island in the Aegean Sea of Patmos, where he wrote this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sent which started in Ephesus, and then would filter down to the seven churches. Each one of these churches would, re would read the same, same letter and the same um, uh, condemnation and encouragement that was given to every other church. But Ephesus was an important city at the time. Ephesus was one of the hubs of a trading port that would, uh, sea travelers would go between Antioch, Syria, and up to, up to Ephesus. Um, but Ephesus in itself was a crossroads for trade ports to the inner church. And Ephesus had its own culture. It was a pagan culture. They had an amphitheater that looked over the ocean, and they had grandiose theaters and culture at the time. But one of the things that they always had, they also had the temple that was worshipped for the goddess of fertility, Artemis, whose Roman name was uh, Diana. Now, w one of the problems that you can see is that how this cultural influence from this church would have 
on the church that was formed in Ephesus. Ephesus was established, as you could read about in Acts 19, I don't have it here, by the Apostle Paul with Priscilla and Aquila who went there and established it. The other churches were church plants that came off of the church at Ephesus. And F, the churches it formed was, was brought together under Jesus Christ by these apostles. But the influence of this God temple that was there and the people's false worship were heavy upon the church of Ephesus. And this letter tells us as we go here that they know their works. This church was strong in standing against false teachings. This would have been a church that if you went into probably had very knowledgeable pastors, very diligent people in their church in knowing scripture, people who stood strong against influences that came in and characters who were, who were in the area that put on a fake sense of religion but weren't true to their faith. They had that, and they were praised for that. But we must understand here that there's a great criticism here. But the warnings that were given to them were warnings of encouragement for restoration and love and in the truth of Jesus Christ. Verse 2 commends the church for its sincere and honest efforts, their desire to restrain apostate influence, and they were applauded for it. The church patiently endures in spite of the false teaching surrounding it. It reminds me of parenthood as we try with Herculean efforts to raise our children in a culture that endlessly attempts to attack and diminish God's values. We stand strong to fight the onslaught of cultural messages that scream at our children. What will shape our children? God's truth and love. Or will it be the world's influence? And just as we do, this church was resolved to stand firm against these attacks. But now John gets to the point. The danger zone is exposed in verse 4. They had abandoned their first love. You know, it really doesn't seem possible, and it doesn't make sense, that a church motivated with such perseverance could miss such a critical point of worship. Their efforts were in vain because the very motivation that propelled them was something other than their love for Christ. Churches steep in doctrine with an intellectual interest only, lacking the spirit-filled heart of Jesus, are prone to waywardness. They tend to be legalistic in nature and are wrought with disciplines and condemnation. But let me try that again. Well, so be it. I don't know if you can fix that for me at all. Is that where I was, Mike? I don't know. Anyways, churches that are steeped in doctrine with an intellectual interest alone, lacking the spirit-filled heart of Jesus, are prone to this waywardness. And Jesus said this, though, in John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You know, I can't think of a better example than the way this church was behaving than the Westboro Baptist Church. If anybody's familiar with the Westboro Baptist Church, the legalistic church from the Midwestern part of our nation, what they do is they protest military funerals and hold up murder signs outside of them and embarrassing the families and everyone that are there. They're also known to, post op to protest openly with homosexual with so on homosexuality with derogatory signs accusing the people and holding them out into public places. Um, I'm not telling you that the Bible does not say about homosexuality. But clearly what happens when a church doesn't have a heart for its people, it goes about it the wrong way. 
I can tell you that if I had a friend who was caught in adultery and I wanted to expose the truth of the Lord to him, I wouldn't stand outside his house and hold a sign calling him an adulterer and that he's going to hell. I don't think it'd have a very good effect on showing him the love of the Lord and trying to bring him to Jesus and what he's about. John announces the fate of this church if they don't repent in verse 5. I don't know if my verses are up. I can't go to them. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the work you did at first. If not, I will come to you and me remove your lampstands from its place unless you repent. If this church is not turned from its ways, it will no longer be a light in the darkness, but it will blend into the darkness that surrounds it. For all of its doctrinal accuracies will be in vain. Their efforts will be lost because they were not based on the great love of Jesus. Only that love will ignite the passion. It's like the seeds that Jesus spoke about in Matthew. Only the seeds that fell in fertile soil would grow and yield grain. Without the love of Christ in their hearts, the church of Ephesus would not yield any fruit. Again, we see this in our lives as parents. The discipline of our children should be motivated by our love for them. When our love is misguided, we abuse and condemn them only to produce spiritless adults whose hearts are void of compassion. Certainly there are times that call for tough love, but we must always guard our hearts. When we discipline our children, providing them with gentle correction, as we are modeling God's love for us, his children, he loves us. God is love. And there isn't a doubt in my mind that when he needs to take me to task for a sin that I've committed or teach me a lesson that I haven't yet managed to learn, he'll do it in love. But love alone will not create a spirit-filled, fruit-producing church. Let us look at Thyatira, a church that love, love, loves everyone and everyone in the name of the Lord. Thyatira. I know your works, your love, and your faith and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter words exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is preaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refused to repent of her sexual morality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of their works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give each of you according to your works. This was a church of love. You know, I picture this church in Thyatira as a church that if you walked into you'd probably have five or six people meeting you trying to big you, bring you some Mediterranean blend of tea that they had at the time. Maybe they would have valet parking for your chariot as you pulled up and then reshoe your horses off to the side while you listened to the sermon. This was a kind church, a church that you would really like to be in. You know, people were very loving and very caring. Um, but there was a problem with this church. This church had disregarded doctrine. Thyatira was a church that was started by Ephesus, and it was a church some 40 miles from Ephesus, Ephesus inland. Thyatira was a manufacturing city. The people were in trade guilds in the city, and what they did was they would go between each other and have um, organizations where they would work between groups on their uh, production. They would produce clothes, they would produce dye, they would do some leather works and some bronze, and they all stayed together in guilds according to their skills. The problem was that each, skill, each guild had kind of its own culture. They would have pagan rituals of worship of gods that they would go to within these guilds, and they would have sexual intimacy between the people. And the church had turned a blind eye to this. They had accepted it as part of what was going on. There was nobody in the church standing up to the truth of God and the doctrine that, he, that, that he, they knew that he stood by. 
Thus John's letter to him. John begins by praising the church for their efforts in love. Yes, John recognizes this church as being warm and welcoming, a church that anyone would find accepting. I picture tolerance and understanding, but don't be deceived, they tolerate that woman Jezebel. That's how he speaks of the tolerance Jezebel. Jezebel, our church has gone over when Perry did his famous sermon on who let the dogs out, um, if you remember. For those who don't, Jezebel was um, the wife of King Ahab of Israel. King Ahab married Jezebel, who was a Philistine woman and who had pagan practices. She worshiped Baal. She had uh, brought this worship to the kingdom of uh, northern Israel when she was married to Ahab. And if you remember what happened to uh, Queen Jezebel, she was pushed out the window and her blood was lapped up by the dogs. God have enough of this nonsense. Now, nobody names their daughters Jezebel anymore, and I think that's why. But the church was told that if they tolerated her, there would be great tribulation. The practices that were overlooked and not condemned here were in one word, ungodly. This was a case of a little bit of yeast ruining the whole loaf. As dangerous as Ephesus was without love, Thyatira was equally as perilous for their failure to stand for truth. Jesus' time spent with his disciples is probably one of the most gracious acts of love God could perform for humanity. But Jesus also spent time teaching them truth. Yes, love is of vital importance. But without doctrine, truth is meaningless. When one does not stand for truth, soon there is no truth. Jesus said he is truth, the way and the light. You can't remove truth from Christ. It's part of his essence. Back to my parenting analogy. When parents are permissive with their children, anything goes. Underage drinking parties, boy, girl, sleepovers in our living room. We don't want to judge or alienate our children. We want to be liked. In the name of tolerance and understanding, we fail to be the leaders in our homes, and by not asserting our values and beliefs, we are condemning our children to a wayward existence. Verse 23 warns them of their fate. God, in essence, delivers them over to their depraved nature. A holy and righteous God takes no part in sinful practices. He sent Jesus to save us from th things through his atoning work on the cross. With love, there must always be truth. Ephesians tells us to speak truth in love. Families and parents that fail to do so are headed for disaster, and it's just a matter of time. Notice that God in his grace calls both churches to repentance. His love and his holiness will patiently endure, but they must listen and heed his advice just like the prophet Moses said about the prophet they were, they were sent. You must listen to him. These churches had decisions to make based on the truth and love of Jesus Christ. The warnings that John wrote are, back, are still very much for us today. We need to find the balance that includes standing in truth, having Christ in our hearts, and sharing him with the world. We cannot approach it only from one side. All three legs of the table are necessary, else the table will topple. God planned and prepared the way and now offers it to us. The Bible calls it the gospel. Its truth endures and its warnings hold true. It, incidentally, the region today that John wrote to in the first century has one of the smallest number of believing Christians of anywhere in the world. I'll let you decide if John's letter was heeded. Concluding 
as the worship team comes forward. The call to repentance God gave his churches is really no different for us. We are God's church. God sees our obedience as evidence of love for him. If you love me, you will obey me. To know God's word and to give it the priority in our lives glorifies God. We must read God's word, live God's word, teach God's word, and obey God's word. The Bible says that God is love. All human beings bear the image of God. We reflect his image when we love. God's plan of salvation was a plan of love, for God so loved the world. When it becomes difficult to love, we can really find humility in the love our Savior had for us while we were still running from him. His suffering and atoning death was proof of his love when he rose from the grave and proved his power over death. He died for us because he loved us. Faith in Jesus delivers us from death. That's the good news and that's the gospel. But the plan didn't end there. There was a part that says he will return for those that are his. For those who have faith in him, for those who love him. And the promise that God made was eternal life, again with a savior. If you don't have that, I hope you heard that message today. If you don't, you can talk to any one of the elders here and we'd love to share our love with you. We close in prayer. Heavenly Father, by your grace you bring your word to us. You tell us truth and you give it to us in love. I pray that we heard, Lord, today and that our hearts were changed and that we come to know you deeper and love you deeper. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.